Hello, and welcome to uh, our sixth lecture. This is our final wrap up for uh, synaptic transmission and uh, focusing really specifically on the process of neurotransmission and neurons. Uh, in the next couple of lectures, we'll be looking more at overall uh, neural anatomy, brain structures, um, nervous systems, etc. But let's finish up our discussion of this process of synaptic transmission. We talked in the last lecture about chemical transmission and neurotransmitters. I want to talk about specific neurotransmitter systems. In fact, that's the bulk of what we'll talk about in this lecture, and then finish with a brief discussion of electrical transmission, uh, which isn't very common, but does occur. So these are the neurotransmitter systems we're going to talk about. There are others. There are also neurosteroids, which we'll be getting into at some point. Uh, but I want to focus on acetylcholine, dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, glutamate, GABA, and the neuropeptides. So acetylcholine is... Uh, an important neurotransmitter. This is one of the earliest that was discovered because it is so involved in the peripheral nervous systems, uh, somatosensory nervous system as well as the autonomic nervous system. So the nicotinic type of acetylcholine receptors control our skeletal muscles, but are also involved in memory and some other functions, as are the muscarnic receptors. The muscarnic receptors, however, do not control our skeletal muscles. They control our involuntary muscles. So these are often a target for drugs such as bladder control medications because the muscarnic receptors control those smooth muscles of things like the bladder. Now, um, these two different receptor types have important functions both in the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. So we talked uh, in the previous lecture about acetylcholine esterase and how it breaks down acetylcholine in the synapse. And by blocking acetylcholine esterase, we can try to improve memory in people with Alzheimer's disease with drugs like Aricept, but also um, irreversible acetylcholine esterase inhibitors are poison. So um, nerve gas, pesticides, etc. So the cholinergic system is an important part of our central nervous system and is associated uh, primarily with learning and memory is one of, the, one of the things we will talk a great deal about um, and its effects on memory. And in fact, we often uh, know that uh, acetylcholine is involved in memory because of uh, anticholinergic drugs uh, such as scopolamine. Scopolamine is, uh, scopolamine is often given uh, for nausea, uh, particularly uh, motion sickness, but it also causes amnesia. So it's uh, one thing we will uh, talk about when we start talking about drugs in memory. So if we look at the acetylcholine system um, within the brain, we have uh, broad areas of the brain uh, projecting from uh, subcortical structures like the basal forebrain, the hippocampus, which is where we get involved with memory, um, out to uh, all of the association areas of the cortex. Uh, we also have um, projections to the cerebellum, which are important for um, motor functions, and then down to the um, tracks within the uh, medulla and the pons. These are important uh, because they are, of course, involved in regulating uh, the body's internal environment. The dopamine pathways uh, are very important. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about dopamine in a variety of ways, but dopamine is the primary reward hormone. Um, so it's very important from a, uh, an addiction perspective. We'll talk about how uh, certain uh, recreational drugs can influence dopamine and then influence cognitive function. So for example, uh, cocaine and amphetamines uh, alter our ability to evaluate risk, and so oftentimes people will engage in more risky behaviors when they're under the influence of those drugs, and that's primarily due to their effects on dopamine. <clears throat> the hypothalamus to pituitary gland is an important part, uh, an important dopamine pathway. There are actually three pathways we'll talk about. Uh, this one controls primarily uh, hormones. The hypothalamus controls uh, our body's hormone levels by uh, influencing the pituitary gland. Uh, the substantia nigra to the basal ganglia, this is involved in motor coordination. This is the part of the brain that um, can be damaged during, uh, or can be damaged by Parkinson's disease and can affect our motor coordination quite a bit. And this is the target of drugs like L-DOPA, are just trying to replace that dopamine from the loss of these neurons in the substantia nigra. Finally, we have the, um, what's called the mesocortical pathway. Um, which is involves the ventral tegmental area, the cortex, and the limbic system. And this is generally involved with what's called the reward pathway and our feelings of reward. And so when we talk about things like gambling, when we talk about drug use, or just general rewards and motivated behaviors, we'll be talking about the reward pathway. 
Interestingly, we will also talk about how the um, uh, executive functions such as working memory have can exert top-down control over the reward pathway. And so that'll be something very important we talk about when we get to uh, working memory and executive functions. So here's a look at these dopamine pathways. So we have the mesolimbic pathway um, coming from that ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens, which is our, the primary reward center as well as the hippocampus memory centers. Then we have the mesostriatal pathway, which is that substantia nigra, basal ganglia, caudate and putamen uh, pathways. So here we have the mesocortical pathway um, and here we have the mesostriatal pathway. Norepinephrine, uh, another very important neurotransmitter. Um, kind of follows the uh, somewhat similar paths to dopamine. We have axonal projections that travel down the spinal cord where they can ex exert an analgesic-like action. Uh, it's one of the reasons why uh, people that are abusing drugs like uh, methamphetamine oftentimes don't experience pain in the same way because uh, so they sort of have this sort of appears like they have superhuman strength and aren't uh, feeling pain because those drugs cause a significant release of norepinephrine. So the release of norepinephrine produces an alerting, focusing, orienting response, as well as positive feelings of reward. Um, and these are associated with the sympathetic nervous system. And so when you have a sympathetic nervous system response, which we'll be talking about in upcoming lectures, this is when you have that fight or flight response. And so you're alert, focused, paying attention, maybe a little bit paranoid, heart rate is increased. All of those things are happening because of the release of, neuro of norepinephrine. And so drugs that are what we call sympathomimetic, mimic a sympathetic nervous system response because they release norepinephrine. Serotonin is involved in mood regulation. Serotonin gets a lot of discussion uh, because for a long time we believed it was part of uh, what was causing depression, that is serotonin dysregulation. But it's actually not. Depression is not a disorder of serotonin levels or regulation. We do use selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors to treat depression but they're treating depression by altering um, neural structures, not uh, just neurochemistry. So it's really important to understand that serotonin, while it is involved in mood, um, is not the major culprit when it comes to depression. In fact, um, cortisol, which is a stress hormone we'll be talking about, is actually uh, much, more, much more part of the uh, causal process than is serotonin. So, as I mentioned in a previous lecture, there are numerous serotonin receptor subtypes. We call these the 5-HT receptors because we go from tryptophan to 5-hydroxytryptophan to serotonin. And these 5-HT receptors, uh, as you can see, there are sort of seven classes, and then these are sub... 5-HT1 uh, and 5-HT2 have sub-receptor types. So, you know, we have over 10 different uh, types of 5-HT receptors at least. Uh, the pathways for serotonin sort of largely parallel those of dopamine. Um, they have very different effects, but certainly we have very similar pathways involving both motor pathways, memory, and uh, association cortex, and we'll get into that later on. Glutamate um, as our major excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. It comes from a metabolic pathway via the Krebs cycle or from glutamine via glutaminase binds to several receptor subtypes. Uh, this is where we get into what's called the NMDA receptor, the kinate receptor, and the AMPA receptor. The NMDA receptor is mediated by glutamate and glycine and serine, and it requires membrane depolarization by one of these other um, receptor subtypes or neurotransmitters. And this NMDA receptor is really important because it's involved in memory formation. One of the things we're gonna talk about it, with the NMDA receptor is how it has a number of, of um, receptor locations on it, uh, which can be influenced by a variety of different neurotransmitters and drugs. So we'll get into that uh, more when we get further into the semester. So GABA is gamma aminobutyric acid, very important neurotransmitter. Uh, it's a universally inhibitory neurotransmitter. It's found in high concentrations in both the brain and the spinal cord. It's made from glutamate under control of enzyme, uh, the enzyme glutamic acid decarboxylase, or GAD. Um, and importantly, benzodiazepine sedatives are GABA agonists. And so benzodiazepines are an important class of drugs. These are drugs like Xanax, Valium, Ativan. Uh, nor benzodiazepine drugs are often sleep aids like Ambien. 
And these drugs are important to understand because they have a number of effects because of their effects on GABA. So while they relieve anxiety, which is their primary function, they also uh, reduce uh, our breathing and also interact with alcohol because alcohol is also a GABA agonist, um, but also have very um, significant negative effects on memory. And in fact, in uh, some of the research I've been involved with, we use a benzodiazepine known as midazolam or Versed to cause uh, short-term amnesia. So essentially, participants have no memory for about uh, 15, 20 minutes uh, after they've been given this drug. It's given a lot in um, outpatient settings, in uh, surgical settings, mostly uh, as a sedative, but also uh, so that people don't remember very unpleasant procedures. Finally, the neuropeptides. Uh, these are small proteins, chains of amino acids that are attached in very specific orders. Um, in this particular course, we're not gonna spend a ton of time on opioid receptors um, because they're not as involved in uh, cognition as are some of these other receptors, but they're important because these are involved in pain relief. And so the opioid receptors, the mu, delta, and kappa receptors are um, involved in pain relief as are endorphins and enkephalins. Finally, I wanna finish up with electrical transmission. So some neurons are connected via what we call gap junctions. These gap junctions allow for rapid transmission of information. Essentially, rather than releasing uh, chemicals into a synapse, the electrical signal just continues across uh, this gap junction, as you can see here. Uh, importantly, these electrical impulses lose their magnitude as they cross the junction, so they might go from being an action potential to just being an EPSP. Um, but also important to understand, information can travel in both directions. That is, uh, neurotransmission can back propagate to this previous neuron. So this is uh, an important part of how the brain functions altogether. Uh, we probably won't spend a lot of time talking about these, but it's important for you to understand that they do exist. All right, well that is neurotransmission. Um, we will be looking at brain neural anatomy and nervous systems in the next series of lectures.